but you take like you know the point that's halfway in between them and you draw a line like that and that <coughs> defines the set of swing voters right that's sort of the idea I the difference between two, two D and one D like it's still the median uh, well I mean I don't I mean median along both positions or uh, yeah. Well, but there's no well-defined median. I mean, the, like you can be weaning along one direction, and then you get to some point, and then that what's median along any dimension will depend on where you are in this. It just it, it just doesn't really work that you see what I mean. There's there's no clear way to define it. Well, the median would just be if you assume like the two candidates are like different points. The median is just the line that goes between them, right? Either yeah, yeah, and then but then he's saying that they're going to run towards there. But then where do they go from there, like along the other dimension? And it's, it's co-determined. I mean, so the equilibrium is not so simple in, the, in that sort of a model. But I'm, I'm thinking of a case where they're like a little bit sticky and they can't fully move there. So the question is, where are they trying to move? Yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah. I was, I was kind of thinking, when does this get really weird? And I was wondering yeah. if this was one time that it might get really weird is if you had a situation where the people tended, who tended to be closer to the middle on the social spectrum yeah. tend to um, yes, that's have a good a point. very extreme other views. And that's then, a good point, right? So, so then, then in order to run to the center, you actually have to run to one extreme or the other. That's a great point, James, yeah. Is, is there any case where um, actually the both parties means so talking about the sort of uncreated dimension? So that's so why to say the topic of the of the of the discussion into sort of one direction. Yeah, I mean there's lots of models of like communication, equilibria in these sorts of games. I don't I don't know them that well, but I think that you can get quite a lot of explanation at least of the common rhetoric that people have just by thinking about you know the Spence model. So so the second issue uh, that uh, I think it was Rishank mentioned, or maybe Chrissy mentioned, not everybody uh, votes, right? And um, what might that lead uh, people to do, Chrissy? Um, oh, which people? If, oh, Dan yeah, mentioned it, yeah. Yeah, what, 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 what will it lead the, the parties to do? Yeah. If it's going to come from retaining their current voters or if it's going to be from getting new voters. And like if you think yeah. the business is in advertising, they always say it's more expensive to get new customers than to retain all of yeah. them. May or may not be true. Yeah. But in particular, you need to potentially cater to your base to try to get them to turn out to vote. Right. Right? And so that was like Bush's strategy in 2004. He didn't really run so much to the center. He actually ran to his base so that they would all turn out to vote. And that ended up winning him the election. Right. So, in fact, mu much of political science, I think, can be thought of as just an application of these different aspects of Spence's model. Um, okay. Now, Jensko and Shapiro, in 2010, used this model to study media slant. So what they did is they looked at local monopoly newspapers around the United States, um, and they thought of them as lying on a simple, single-dimensional left-right axis, um, but with just a single firm. And they tried to measure the slant, the left-right slant of a newspaper by using language. And how did they do that, Prashant? Do you remember? Uh, well, they identified like, certain, certain keywords that like, both parties use. Um, so for like, Republicans, it's something that has, like, has to do with like, uh, immigrants and like, illegal immigrants. Yeah. And, like, uh, just like taxes. That yeah. And the Democrats or like, poor people or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So they, they identified like taxes, uh, phrases that Republicans use like death tax, legal aliens. Democrats use like poor people, workers, rights, tax breaks. And then they calibrated, to do that, they calibrated it from the congressional record by reading in the statements of Republicans and Democratic 
legislators, and they found the ones that were most more used by Republicans, most more used by Democrats. And then they read the newspapers. They had the computer read the newspapers, and they identified which of those words uh, did the newspaper use. Did they sound like they were a Republican, or did they sound like they were a Democrat, based on the words they were using? And they rated each paper on whether they write like someone from what each of the parties writes like, right? And then they broke um, local newspaper markets up into districts that had people with different politics. And then they tried to measure which districts do and do not read the newspaper, and from that infer something about what the demand was for slant. Uh, and um, did anyone remember how they did that? Yeah, Chrissy. Yeah. And, um, they also compared within their zip codes the number of people registered to vote within any of the political parties. Yeah. So that they could compare the rating of the newspaper with the people reading the newspaper. Exactly. Exactly. And then um, they could, from that, compute what would be the ma profit maximizing level of slant in that particular area, right? And uh, Rashank, what do you do? You remember what they ended up finding? Yeah. It was very much similar to like the actual theoretical model uh, that firms actually maximize. Yeah. So what they found is that um, you could explain like 30% of the variation in the political slant from what would be profit maximizing. And that once you controlled for that, that who owned the newspaper had no effect. That is, if you like looked at someone who owned a bunch of other right-wing newspapers, you might think, oh, that guy's right-wing. Turns out it's just because he lives in right-wing area. And so he's catering to the people. So who owns the newspaper has no effect except through um, what the, the, the area was. So here's a picture. They, in the markets that were highly Republican, they found very right-wing uh, newspapers. In the markets that were less Republican, they found more left-wing uh, newspapers. OK. Yeah, James. How did they separate from the problem that how did they find out that the area was Republican before that newspaper was in that area? Because they used demogra demographic characteristics to instrument for how Republican or Democratic that area was. And they assumed that that wasn't affected by the newspapers. Yeah. It was on religion. Uh, like oh, religion. Their instruments was religion because they said that that's highly correlated to political um, sites. And it has nothing to do with reading newspapers. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. So actually, that, that's actually the most problematic of the thing, their instruments. Like, race is much less problematic. The religion thing is actually quite problematic because it turns out that um, Americans report being like the most religious people in the world. Like, people in America all say they go to like church at some huge rate. Turns out that if you actually track who goes to church, they don't go to church at any higher rates than anyone in Europe. It's just that. Um, Americans like to say that they're religious more than Europeans like to say they're religious. And one reason that Americans like to say they're religious is because they think it says something about their political thing. Yeah. And so, like, Republicans are much more likely to overreport going to church than Democrats are. And so, actually, having a newspaper could convince you that you should lie to the pollster and tell them that you're. Anyway, but, okay. So, um, so. Notice that here, um, why were we thinking that profit maximizing would be the, the thing that the, gets the most people to buy the newspapers? Well, the main reason is not because you make profits off of the sales of the newspapers. You make profits off of getting readership so you can sell it to advertisers, right? Um, and so you can think of readers as producing a characteristic of the newspaper that makes that product valuable to the real consumers of the newspaper who are the advertisers, right? So really, getting readership is not con like selling to consumers. It's really buying from producers in some sense, right? Um, and so I'm going to use, when we talk about this sort of a setting, the term user 
rather than talking about a consumer because everyone is sort of consuming and contributing at the same time. And a firm that has this as an important part of its business model, I want to call a platform. They're also sometimes called two-sided markets or networks. And there are tons of examples of this in the world, and they're becoming increasingly important uh, in many businesses. So Neil, could you give some examples of things that you think are like good examples of platforms? Do you think that an important component of what makes Mac attractive is who else buys Macs? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's Until interesting. Parents start buying them. <laughs> Until parents start buying them. As, as a commercial, right? So yeah. Undermine that platform. Yeah. Uh, Any anyone else? Uh, yeah, Eric. What about, isn't it also like platform you just described like stuff like Facebook or yep. like Apple's App Store, where basically it allows for people to create content and. Give it to other people. Yeah, exactly. So if the users are generating content, then in a very literal sense, it's a platform, right? Um, so yeah, for Sean. Well, I was just wondering, like, how the like the model that Jupiter and Al talked about, yeah, um, like would fits in with like uh, newspapers and uh, like becoming more digital. Yeah. And, like these advertisers are becoming more niche towards a particular like set of like demographics, but at the same time, you have like this more centralized. Content. Yeah, targeting in advertising is a huge topic recently in economics uh, because you want to attract now people who, if you target the op optimal advertisement at them, will be most valuable rather than the people who would be most valuable if you target the standard advertising at them. So that changes who's a valuable reader to try to attract, right? So I guess, like, to that point, like, with this, with this business model, like, as the newspaper is becoming more digital, it doesn't matter. Like the sort of the slant idea doesn't matter, right? Because as long as you can get the advertisers to like have some sort of algorithm to pinpoint to particular sets of readers. well, the slant thing does matter, I think. But income of your readers is going to matter now more rather than just readership, because once you have high income readers, the amount you can extract from them using the optimal advertisement is almost certainly higher. Whereas it used to be that maybe the high income readers they didn't like the advertisements that were being targeted at a broad audience, right? Okay, so media platforms are a classic example. Newspapers, television, websites, they try to attract people to sell them to advertisers, right? Payment platforms are another good example. Credit card, debit card, PayPal, because it's only worth using it if people accept those cards, right? Um, operating systems like smartphones, video games, etc are only valuable if people produce content for those. Yeah, Eric. So is a platform just more generally like any sort of closed like system or network that you sort of buy into and once you're like... Well, as long as the value of being on it depends on who else is on it. Yeah. Is that necessarily true for, for example, video games, right? You buy a specific console and then you buy games that are for that console, right? Yeah. That doesn't, like, I mean, you, you can easily say, that, oh, so the value of having a console depends on your friends having it. No, but, no, it, I mean, there's, that's a little you, bit of it, but more important is that it depends on who develops the games for the console. Okay, so when you say who else is on it, you mean, it could be, like, you're, a, like, you're on the demand side, they're on the supply side. Yeah, on the other side of the market. Uh, so that's like a multi-sided platform rather than a one-sided platform. Um, transaction platforms are another good example. eBay, financial markets, et cetera. Um, because there's sellers and buyers, and each side provides liquidity for the other sides. There's lots of other examples. Dating websites, yellow pages, shopping malls, et cetera. Yeah, Neil. Uh, what about things like, is, can the mechanism for that just be like how big the, the business is? For like, you know, let's say there's something where like there's a large number of subscribers that give the provider enough yeah. money to like, give you more services. Does that count then? That's called an indirect network effect. Uh, and I don't like to count that in this, even though in principle you could, because I just think of that as being an economy of scale. You know what I mean? Yeah, Chris. So language, like the platform, you know, language as a platform? Yeah. yeah. That's what Jim's writing his dissertation about. <laughs> Have you talked to Jim about that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah.